Today, it's all about the when, why, and how of choosing black and white on Behind the Shot. Hi, welcome to Behind the Shot. I'm Steve Brazel. Got a great show lined up for you today. I do want to remind you, if you want the show notes for this show or for that matter, any show that I do, head on over to the website. It's behindtheshot.tv. I've got the show notes there. And of course, if you're watching on YouTube, just head on down below the like and subscribe button. You'll find all the links that we talk about in a description, short description uh, of the show there as well. But the full show notes, again, those are at behindtheshot.tv. Uh, I've got a great show lined up for you today. And I want to jump right in because this guest has been on the show before and I consider a dear friend. And I want to start by just saying up front, if you are not familiar with this guy's products, he's the inventor and co-founder of a company very near and dear to my heart, sitting next to me right here at all times, uh, I want to welcome Dr. T to the show. Larry, how are you? Fine. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you so much for having me back on Behind the Shot. So for those of you that don't know Dr. T, Larry Tiefenbrunn, he is the founder and uh, CEO of Platypod, which is one of my favorite products. I use them all the time, and I like I just showed you, I have one sitting next to me. Those of you on audio, it's going to be a little harder for you to see it. But you were on the show before, episode number 57. It was back in 2018. I think it was called Better Product Photography, and we had the shot of a beautiful guitar that you had taken that we talked about, and I want to catch up with you a little bit. First thing I want to ask, you are a practicing pediatrician. Do you still practice? Oh, yes, and <laughs> we're quite busy. We have a teaming five-man practice in central New Jersey. And so something I've always wondered about you is with that and Platypod and everything else that you do, do you sleep? Uh, yeah, I do sleep, <laughs> but I don't walk. I run <laughs> in between everything. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're doing a lot of things. Platypod in particular in my head would take a lot of time and especially more now. For those unaware of Platypod, and I'm going to hold mine up again here really quick. It's on, mine's on the little extension. Let me go to my camera. Uh, mine's on the little extension with a little ball head on it too. But for those unaware of Platypod, how do you describe Platypod to people? It's a flat tripod that you can sit in your pocket. Some people call it, I think Scott Kelby likes to call it a tripod alternative. We call it the world's most compact tripod base. And what's beautiful about it is it will hold the heaviest of camera equipment and take up no space in your camera bag because it just slips into a side pocket. And you can use it with practically any tripod ball head, including some that we've made too. Which, so I did, we're going to talk about Platyball here in just a second, but when I did an unboxing of the Elite and the the Ergo and the Platyball, I was up a, we call it Mount Rubido. It's a hill, but it's a pretty big hill. Uh, and I was using my Platypod with the spikes, the whole bit on a rock. The moon was out. It was during the day and I'm photographing the moon with a 150 to 600 lens on a 5D Mark IV at that point in time on a Platyball and a, and a Platypod. So the 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 family of Platypod has grown since we last talked. Uh, Platyball, for those that don't know Platyball, I have an unboxing of the two that I did that's up on, on the YouTube channel. It's only on the YouTube channel. I didn't release it to the podcast feed. But I use the phrase, it's turning a ball head upside down. I'm not sure that you describe it that way. How do you describe Platyball? Well, I, I think you started off right. And Here's a there, platyball. That's the elite. You just want to get an idea. This is the platyball elite, and this is the platyball ergo, uh, together with a little uh, Arca disc adapter that we have. But the two are equivalent, except for the fact that the elite has a actually the world's very first electronic leveling indicator on it, um, and. You know, we could get the, into that in a little more detail later, but what's cool about this is, A, it's an upside-down design. So, first of all, even when your tripod legs are not uh, set evenly, if they're not balanced, as long as the top is level, you can then pan 360 degrees and it stays level. Whereas with other tripods that are panning from the bottom, if your tripod legs are not level, when you go to pan, you're panning and it's turning off 
towards the ground or towards the sky. That's the that's the ball head upside down idea. So if you took that right now and you flipped it upside down, that's a normal ball head where the ball Correct. is on the top and you can have the panning surface out of alignment. That's why I like this thing. I also like the fact that I have a ball head that I love, an older one, uh, l- happen to like it a lot, but there's three knobs and I always grab the wrong knob. And more importantly, often I need two hands because when I release a knob, it sounds like a commercial. I apologize. When This is not a sponsored video, folks, so that you know. He's just a friend and I like the product. Um, but when I, when I utilize my other ball head, no names being mentioned, I need two hands because when I undo a knob, I have to hold the body of the camera so it doesn't fall. Whereas this, you're holding the camera in essence as you operate the two buttons, which is a cool design. What what is the difference again between the Elite and the Ergo other than the the level? one ounce and the fact that one has the uh, the leveling indicator on the back and the other one does not. And I would say this one's maybe a little bit more comfortable con- to use because you can stick it right in the palm of your hand. This one, the way you hold it is you put your thumb over the top back here. Okay. But then the controls are operated with just these two buttons. So this button locks, this button unlocks, you can move it around. And it the variable tension is right in these buttons. There's no separate tension knob. You can get this to kind of a medium tension where it holds position, but you can still shift it and it will still hold position without falling over, even with a fairly heavy camera on it. And also the panning head is really super smooth and it locks just with this simple thumb wheel. So again, there's no knob for that and it locks really nice and tight. And then the Arca clamp on here is a simple ratchet device that's operated by a little collar ring back here. So again, we've eliminated all knobs from well, uh, from the system. One of my favorite parts of this, this whole design for me was... Uh, those buttons, I even said to you at one point when you sent me like, you know, pre-production models to unbox, I even said to you at one point, are these air? And you said, oh no, because air, you wouldn't feel the tension the same way. And that's, what's cool is as you squeeze them, you feel the air. Let's, let's, um, let's talk platypod itself. So you have the ultra and you have the max, uh, ultra being the smaller one, max being the bigger one. Is that so the only just, difference? Just to between... give a quick, quick history, Steve, if you yeah, want. Yeah, do it. This was the very original Platypod. I don't oh, know if you even remember this one. That came out in 2015. It actually had two little bolts on a quarter 20 and a three eighth inch bolt. And then we came, people wanted something bigger. So we came out with Platypod Max in 2017. So whereas this plate was about the size of a smartphone. I mean, the iPhone used to be a little shorter than this. So this was the size of like the iPhone 4 back in its day. Uh, This is the size of an iPad mini. It's about uh, five and a half by almost eight inches. You've got something new coming now. Yes, we do. Now, actually, after after Max came Ultra, we replaced that original, this original plate here. So we gave we gave people a way to uh, right. That's what you've got there to also put straps on here, a way to hold that with carabiner. So we retired the original what we called Platypod Pro back then. And yes, now we've got something new. Do you want to get into that now? Yeah. So we're recording this before the date, but this is going to go live on the seventh and the day before you're making the announcement. So by the time you watch this show, the announcement has been made on on Scott Kelby's The Grid, which Scott's a friend, and it's a great show that he and Eric Kuna, and he has guests on all the time, do uh, for Kelby One. Uh, so a little plug for Scott. If you're not watching Scott's stuff, and if you're not following Scott's blog, by the way, seriously, amazing. He has guest blog Wednesdays. It's a fantastic blog. So Just this Google new Scott product. Scott Kelby blog, and you'll find that there. Yeah, scottkelby.com is what it is. Uh, this new product. You've got the Ultra. You've got the Max. Why a new product? So uh, if, if you don't mind, Steve, I'm just going to tip my camera down. You, yeah, do you, it. Won't, you won't be able to look at my face, but that's okay. <laughs> Anyhow, 
a new one called the Platypod Extreme. Essentially, we are in the process of retiring Max and replacing it with an all new plate because we had so many nice features on this that I thought it was really worthwhile going to a new product and launching it again on Kickstarter. So here is the new Platypod Extreme. Oh. Okay. And the first thing that you'll notice is instead of the spikes being stored in a box, the spikes are now mounted on the plate. But how do you use this? So let's put Max aside here for a second. So this is an actual this. replacement for Max, though. Yes, it is. Yes, okay. it is. It's, it, it's in fact, it's almost exactly the same size as Max, but with some major new features. One of the things that I liked and didn't like about Max was the fact that each time you wanted to set it up on rock or concrete and use the spikes, you'd have to screw it into these holes, which if you're just going in a little bit, okay, that takes a few seconds. All right. But if I want to go all the way through, you know, that the whole setup till it's balanced and everything could take me two minutes. And I thought there would be a better way if we could mount the spikes right onto the plate in hinges. But we had to figure out a way to make hinges work. So together with my brilliant engineer in uh, Utah named Marin Swayze, we figured out a way to make these spring-loaded hinges. And let me show you how easy it is to use this. Okay, all you do is you pull on the spike, you rotate, and it clicks into place. Let me show you a different angle. You pull on the spike, you rotate, and it just clicks into place. I'll show you something interesting when you're as you're rotating this. Well, you're going to say, Larry, but it's not, they're not straight down. They're pointing outward for a very good reason. When you put these outward like this, you now have a trapezoid. And as many of you with some engineering background, or if you've looked at cantilever bridges, you know that a trapezoid is just about the most stable uh, geometric shape that you can have. So once it's like this, it just really holds nicely, and you can spike that onto rock or concrete. If you want to put it on an elevated surface, like a ramp, or we've even had photos taken of this on ice walls in, in, in Iceland, you could put it up like this, and it could grab on to a vertically ascending uh, ledge, and it will still maintain balance. And then all you'd have to do is put your ball head on this. But before I show you how to do that, we also have other positions for these spikes. They can face both uh, rearward and forward. You can turn them upside down, and then these rubber these rubber feet are down. And again, it's just one two, three, four, and I don't have to sit there screwing anything in. If it's a little bit off level, you just twist one of them and you have, because they're screws, you have two inches of adjustment that you can do so you can raise. That way, if you, wanted, if you wanted to mount it on top of a car, you got some padding, so. Yes, and, and, you, and you can level it if you want to also. Uh, so once you've, got, once you've got this set up, you just take your ball head, in this case here, I'll just take a, a platter ball, and you start turning that, then spin it on, and it goes on very smoothly, and now you've got a way to take your pictures. You take Now, by the way, if you're going to use the, the spikes in a vertical position, these two come with an extra set of little plastic caps that you can put on here so you don't scratch your uh, wrist, and there's an instructional video that we have that goes through that. I can tuck the spikes away. There's, uh, I don't know if you can see, there's actually a little notch in the plate here. It's a parking place for the, for the spikes so that when they're parked into place, and I'll do all four here, then you can just take this, hang it off your clothing on a carabiner, and you're not going to scratch yourself. This will right, sit right. on a table, nice and smooth. The spikes don't scratch the table in this position. The bottom is that smooth. It's going to be crowdfunded, right? Yes. Is it going on? It, it went on Kickstarter on the 6th, on okay. April 6th. So it's it's on Kickstarter when you when you see this. But if people want more information or the Kickstarter link, 
the easiest way is to just go to www.platypod.com. That's uh, P-L-A-T-Y-P-O-D.com. And right on our landing page, you're going to have a link to go directly to Kickstarter. We have uh, two very nice video uh, presentations. One is a promotional video. The other one's an instructional video by our friend Larry Becker, which, where he shows you exactly how to use the plate properly and how to get the most out of it. I appreciate your showing that. Uh, because again, you and I have talked for years. I love your products. Your mind works in a way that I really wish mine did and it doesn't. Uh, and I like the improvements that you've done. Cause again, this is the first time I'm really seeing this thing. You sent me the one graphic I just had up and that's about the, all I've seen. So, uh, let's go into photography here for a second. I was looking through your portfolio as we were picking the image that we were going to discuss for today. And I noticed something I don't think I ever noticed in your work before. And I'm wondering if you've noticed it. You have a common thread in your work. You use contrast well. I'm not going to say your images are all high contrast, but they all have an amount of contrast uh, that pops. Are, are you aware of that? It's conscious, actually. I um I, I consider myself, uh, by reading, somewhat of a student of Ansel Adams. Now, Ansel Adams was a wonderful photographer. I, I don't know if he was the best at portrait photography or product photography, but certainly in landscape, uh, no one came close. You know, we go out in the field and we sh we'll shoot a few hundred pictures in one day. Remember that Ansel Adams was going out with an 8x10 box camera. And and sometimes he'd put it on top of his station wagon on a uh, on a set of uh, tripod sticks, and he took one sheet, two sheets, maybe the most at the time ten sheets of film, and that was it. So he had to get it right, you know, the first time in camera, and then would go into the darkroom, and it was a master of darkroom photography. Contrast. Why contrast? Well, Ansel, Ansel Adams was the proponent and actually developer of what was known as the zone system. And I think any serious student of photography needs to learn and needs to understand the zone system and incorporate it into their photographic souls because it's very, very important when you're looking at a scene. It was a nine point system going anywhere from stark white with no detail in the white. I think that was considered zone nine. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. And zone zero was absolutely black with no details in the black. Now today, and, and everything else was, was in between. So snow with a little bit of texture would be zone eight. Shadows with a little bit of texture, minimal texture would be, so for, for example, if you're, if you're taking an image of uh, black fur or black hair, but you want to still see the hair. Well, that would be zone zone one, and you would or zone two, and you would position different elements in different zones and adjust your exposure accordingly. If you want to learn about this, you can still get a copy of Ansel Adams' book, The Negative, and he describes the zone system in there. There's also a lot of talk about. They're about uh, darkroom processing and all that. And if you want to do darkroom photography, then that book is, is also extremely important. But just to learn the zone system is important. So what do we do today? Today we use histograms. But histograms also are essentially based on a zone system. You have your blacks with no, sh with no detail, your whites with no detail, and everything in between. The way I try to look at an image when developing it and when, uh, when shooting it is to try to get a little bit of detail in all the blacks. I can later on decide to make an area totally black and get a little bit of detail in the, in the lights. And if you're able to squeeze everything into there, that's your dynamic range. That's where you're able to see the photograph. And then you can start playing with it in the dark room. And anyone who thinks that Ansel Adams took a negative and just exposed it with an enlarger and produced a, pro a positive, and people are criticizing today Photoshopping, well, let me tell you, Ansel Adams did a 
a major amount of trickery in the darkroom to get his images to look the way they did. They would be dodging and burning. He would alter the temperatures of the solutions that he was developing with to, uh, to obtain different uh, contrast ratios and dynamic ranges. If you want to see today what a picture looks like without, uh, with, with the entire dynamic range in there, if you're shooting in video, uh, in, um, not in raw, what is the term in video? C-log. Log. In, in, in log form, correct. Yeah. Then also you come out with a very muddy picture, but then you take that and you stretch the edges of the dynamic range into the zones that you want. I believe that a good image, an interesting image, in most cases, there's exceptions to everything, but in most cases, an interesting image needs to have something that is close to black and something that is close to white and then a nice amount of gradation in between, unless you're just shooting a foggy, foggy scene and you want to bring that out. But very low contrast often makes for a more more dull image. That has to be used very judiciously. So yes, uh, Steve, in general, when I'm shooting, I'm looking to get a nice range of zones into that image. So that's similar to those of you that use Photoshop and have ever pulled up levels along with curves. Same thing that you're looking at. I, I, last question, and then I want to get into today's image before, before we go too long here. You shoot a lot of different things. Like I've known you to shoot product photography and guitars and landscapes and street photography and portraits. And if you could only shoot one, what's your favorite subject? My grandkids, of course. <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. Okay. Min, yes, very, Min is happy now. Important. Okay. That's right. So That's right. the truth is, I, I, I agree with Rick Salmon um, uh, in, in, in his philosophy, and that is uh, my specialty in photography is not specializing. Uh, I like being a jack of all trades. Um, I hope I'm a master of something in there, but I like the variety. But one thing I love is a common thread is to take a common object and look at it differently. I think you put in the show notes my uh, image of an egg. And to me, that's the most fun when you can take something so simple and mundane, yet try to make it look interesting, look at it differently than other people look at it. Um, I, I, think that's, uh, I think that's really what photography is about. I, I've said the phrase a lot of times. It's an old voiceover thing. You know, how do you do a voiceover of a pair of shoes? We all know shoes. How do you make that exciting? And it's now and then you just have to look at something as though you've never seen it before. Bef before we bring up the image for today, those of you that are watching on YouTube, the show notes for YouTube, all the links that we talk about, those are down below the subscribe and like button. So head on down. You can get them there. If you want deeper show notes, a bit that I wrote about Larry and my feelings on, on his product line and stuff like that, you can head over to the website, which is behindtheshot.tv. One thing I do want to mention, because I did a show recently that wasn't the normal format and some people, I got a lot of new people that don't know the podcast format. They just look at it as I found it on YouTube and it's a YouTube video. So for those of you that are new to the channel, I want to just stress, this is first and foremost, a podcast. So this podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts in either audio only, or if you're a podcast outlet of choice, like Apple podcast supports video, the video feed is actually available as well in your podcast app of choice. And if your podcast app of choice doesn't support video, then we've got YouTube covered for you. Also, I do want to thank dvestore.com for helping me out with the high def video. Great place, dvestore.com, friends of mine as well. And you can head over there and, and uh, check out their product line. Which brings us to the image for today. And for this image, you and I kind of went back and forth picking an image. And this ended up being it for the reason I introduced this show. The how, when, and why somebody might or might not choose black and white. And you call this image the cellist. And I want to get the, the kind of technical details out first. When I looked at the EXIF data in the raw file that you sent me, this was F6, 1 one sixtieth of a second at ISO 3200. Uh, also, white balance manual. And I, I kind of want to start with the white balance manual. Do you always shoot shots like this, manual white balance? 
Well, here the white balance is not so critical because we eventually turned it into into a, a grayscale uh, image. But in general, if I have the time, I like doing white balance manual, and I like doing my color white balance using a, pro a product called an Expo Disc. Uh, the substitute could be certainly a gray card. Expo Disc is nice because you can put it over your camera lens, point it at the light source, which is often the sky or the sun or maybe artificial lighting in the room, and then set the white balance on your camera according to your camera's uh, manual white balance instructions. And then you're good for the rest of that session uh, of the shoot, but you get amazingly accurate uh, white balance with that, uh, with that kind of technique so that when I get into Lightroom or Photoshop, there's nothing left to do. But we will have to talk eventually about why shoot color if you're going to produce black and white. And we'll, well, we'll and we that. will. Let me start here. For those of you on the audio feed, what we are looking at, those of us watching the video, this is a great exercise. Larry and I were talking about this before I hit record. This is a great exercise if you really want to understand somebody's shot, right? Sometimes you'll look at a shot and go, I don't know. When you sit down and try and describe it for people who are not watching, can, can't see it, it's amazing what you'll find in an image, right? So this is a landscape orientation black and white shot. It's a street musician playing a cello. Taller gentleman sitting in a chair. It's like a folding chair. The gentleman playing the cello is on the left rule of thirds and interestingly framed where they are not only on the left side of the image, but they are also facing left out of the frame. So the nose room there is short because the right-hand side of the image is taken up by the open cello case. And the cellist is wearing what appears to almost be a tux, right? It's dark pants. It's a white shirt. It's a bow tie, or excuse me, a white jacket, a bow tie, dressed as though they're playing, you know, an official show, as it were. The flooring appears to be granite or some kind of tile. The cello case is a very nice cello case. It's laid out on the floor parallel to him going from him, the head of the case from him to the base of the case at the right rule of third. Uh, the cellist is facing, like I say, about 45 degrees looking out of the frame. And the lighting is really interesting because as they're sitting on this like granite floor, behind them is a wall, a plain wall. And if I didn't know any better, I'd think that wall was nothing but drywall with drywall screws and nails. And I kept looking at this going, it's, it's, a, it's drywall. Why isn't it finished? I don't know. I don't care. I find it fascinating to me. Uh, again, dress nice, nice shoes, everything. There is a bag hanging on the back of his chair. And... The strap of the case, this is nothing you controlled, I don't think, but it adds to the shot. The case is not flat on the floor. The case has a strap that has been bundled up under the case, lifting the front of the case up, which breaks the straight lines. I actually like that. I think it adds a ton. In the case is critical. You expose the inside of that case, which has almost no light. He's blocking the light. But I can see that in the lid of the case, there is a spare bow. There is a business card holder. There's a basket. Not sure what the basket is for, but okay, there's a basket in there. On the left side of the frame, there's a wooden chair laying down with the legs just encroaching in. And I'm not, I'm not going to lie with you. When I first saw that, I thought, oh, I wish the chair wasn't there. And then... As I started analyzing this picture more, the chair is actually kind of critical because it, it, it makes it not a posed studio shot. It makes it a random place where stuff was there, including the stuff between him and his case. There are two water bottles between he and his case. In many ways, like the wall behind him being drywall, right? In many ways, I can't figure out this scene. I'm not sure if this was a street musician because you wouldn't have drywall on the street. I'm not sure where this guy's at, but I know he's somewhere different. And I love, I love the fact that I'm able to answer those questions 
in my brain. So let's start here before we, we'll get into the black and white in a minute. What is this happening? Well, this is a stroll down the High Line in Manhattan. The High Line was, is a project that was uh, developed God, 20, 25 years ago, where they took the old uh, Hudson train yards and right back down one or two lines of the track, they built a walkway, must, much of it in steel and concrete, and then they lined that walk, walkway with all kinds of interesting plants, vegetation, uh, flowers. And as you walk this, I think it runs from about 35th Street down to Gansworth Street, which is uh, down on the Lower West Side. As you walk there on a weekend day, you're going to hear every language uh, on the planet, people from all over the world just going and strolling and taking in all the interesting sights. Along the way, you'll find some restaurants, vendors, some street entertainers. So this was an area that looked like it was under construction, yet it was open on several, several aspects still. Yes, it's drywall in the back, and it looks so stark, so empty otherwise. You don't know if he's playing by himself he looks so serious and so wrapped in his music and where he's looking out to is he looking out to nothing or is he looking at it, it turned out to be a crowd of about a hundred people uh watching this uh the basket is open for money collections in there and i just thought this was such an interesting uh scene with with real contrast, this this fancy, beautiful dinner jacket with the bow tie and everything, and in a what's otherwise a construction scene, and and you just nailed something, by the way. The again, the fact that he's on the left side of the frame and looking out to the left, leaving, I'm going to use the word white space, but I don't mean white space, right? Leaving leaving that wall on the right, mostly on the right hand side, other than the case, which is on the floor and open. That that makes you wonder what's he looking at, what's out there. Interesting to know it was a hundred people. That seems like a lot, but then the light. And I, I normally I describe the light when I describe the shot, but I waited on purpose because. And by the way, I'm assuming this is all natural light, right? This is all natural light, and as I remember it, the left side of the image was the southern sp- exposure. Uh, this was during the summer, and so you just. And, and it was a hazy day, so you just get this beautiful, hazy, enormous uh, window-like light coming in, uh, giving him uh, pretty much a Rembrandt-type lighting uh, coming from from uh, the from camera left onto the scene. And that's the thing. So the lighting is camera left, lighting up the left side, well, camera left side, his right side of the cello. Correct. His arm. His face is very bright on his right side, camera left, his side. But again, he's turned at 45 degrees. So really the side of his face that is you know, broad to us is shadowed. And then that light casts his shadow and the shadow of the case so softly against oh, this canvas of drywall. enormous amount. It was enormous space of light that was coming in, hitting him. I mean, he, he probably had the equivalent of about a, a 20 by 30 foot softbox. Off it's to, it's uh, this off subtle shadow left. against this plain white, you know, grayish drywall. And the composition using that light, using the shadows, using the shadows in the case, the shadow on the side of his face that's facing the camera, but you can see the far side of the face that's lit up bright. So many people in my head, now I wasn't there obviously, but I I picture so many photographers taking this shot, putting it online saying, hey, what do you people think? And they went straight on and took it straight on. And whether by choice or not, you moving way far around him to his left or right, camera right, makes the shot. Were you... Were you aware as you were doing this that you wanted an off-angle shot? Was it the only place you could stand? 
No, I mean, I could have easily swung left or right. I just liked, I liked the look of this. And, uh, you know, sometimes as you're shooting it, you're shooting what just seems right to you. And then later on, when you're in Lightroom or in the old days in the dark room, you start to think about, you know, exactly why did I do this? Uh, I think it just looked right to me. Uh, the way, if you think about it, the right hand lower line the, where the wall meets the floor forms a leading line that leads right up to him. You have another leading line coming from the, the, the peg at the bottom of the cello that's leading also right up towards his face with the intersection of the bow coming across. So you really have a lot of gesture, I think, in this shot as well. Well, and you've got geometry in this shot. He forms a perfect triangle. Uh, there's a couple of other triangle shapes in here. Uh, like you say, the the way he fits in the spot and he happens to be on the rule of third, which I'm not sure would really matter, but it makes the shot stronger. When you pulled it up afterwards, the chair on the left, I see it now different than when it first came up in front of me that that adds, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it It adds... It adds spontaneity and realism to the It shot adds more than that even, Steve. I, to me, it, I always try to have, and this is, is conscious, I try to have, let, let me backtrack a second. Okay. I think a very important thing that I try to teach younger photographers is when you're taking an image, you should say to yourself, consciously or subconsciously, what is my subject? The subject is the cellist and that expression on his face and his left hand. Everything is really in that tight area. There's a secondary subject of the bow crossing the cello given. But everything else in this image points right up towards that central subject. The legs of the chair on the left hand bring you in towards him. As we said, the line in the right lower corner brings you up towards him. The case points towards him and again the case the is literally an arrow I, exactly everything in here really is an arrow bringing and leading your eye right up to the expression on his face and he's not really looking at the crowd he's looking at his music and i think something else is fascinating the two pictures you've chosen of mine steve are both musical subjects think about why that is oh that's interesting Actually, that never hit me until just now. That's a good point. When, so, when I, when I, you know, I have a very diverse, uh, uh, I have a diverse portfolio uh, at ljtmd.smugmug.com. Anybody can take a look at it. But what I love about showing that portfolio to people is asking, what's your favorite picture? And hardly ever do I get two people in the same room picking the same picture. There's something that speaks to each person. And I think, Steve, with your background in music and concert photography, I think musical instruments speak to you. That's that's it's interesting because that did not hit me until you just said it. But you're right. I And not only that, but as we were looking at pictures, I even pitched to you another guitar shot you have of the same guitar. That's the guitar head. That's <laughs> that's a good point. So we talked earlier about your sense of contrast, which I think for me, is also a sense of depth, right? You, your contrast adds a, a three-dimensional uh, feel to your images. So let's, let's talk about, and it's accentuated here with the black and white. Let's talk about your approach to black and white. This shot, I happen to also have, you sent me a copy of the original image in color. Why take this image? What was your your process of deciding this needs to be black and white. It's going to sound so foolish, Steve, <laughs> but you know what? Um, you have to be careful about having real distractions in your image. If I could have, I would have walked right up there and snatched those water bottles right out of the, right out of the picture. Um, the, the water bottles, the green one and the bright blue one, were so distracting that they killed the image. As soon as I was able to put this into black and white, A, I was able to focus in more on the music and his expression. Because if you go back to the color one more time. Okay. 
When you do this in color, the subject changes. Your eye is drawn very much towards the sharpest thing in the image, yes, but it also is drawn often to the reddest thing in the image. And this deep, warm wood color of the cello practically changed the subject from the cellist to the cello. So you've got to be careful. If there's distracting color elements, then you have to say to yourself, is this image, does this image better bring out my subject in color or in monochrome? Well, and, and I think I, monochrome worked better. Uh, let me add, and I'm, I'm leaving this color image up. Let me add that in many ways, this image feels black and white when it's in color. The wall feels gray. The case is black. His pants and shoes are black. His jacket is white. His shirt is white. His bow tie is black. The chair is black. The floor is a kind of grayish feel. And then, like you say, the richness of the wood in the cello and the two water bottles become this eye vacuum that just sucks you in and and almost makes it that you cannot take in this whole scene. And by switching it to black and white, I immediately now go to the highlights on his face, his arm. I'm aware of the direction of light. I knew those were business cards because they stand out. Whereas again, in the color image, yeah, they stand out in the case, but it's just one little white area with all that color over there. And in the black and white, I start reading the picture differently, if that makes any sense. Sure. We were talking about the zone system earlier. And when you're dealing with a black and white picture like this, starting in color, obviously that zone system becomes different. Highlights are seen differently. So when you look at a picture like this, the brightness on the side of his face, the specular highlights, do you see those differently to you in black and white? In your processing intent, I guess is a way to word it. Well, yeah, I mean, you're looking, you're looking more graphically here. You know, when, when you start seeing this in black and white, you start seeing the shapes, you start seeing the curvature on the case, you start seeing the triangular uh, echoes in here. And, and, and by the way, if you look at his shape with the with the cello, you got one large triangle. Then start dropping your da eye down to the chair, and you've got a triangle, another triangle, another triangle. You got diagonal going through the back of the wall. You got a whole series of triangles in this uh, in this image, which I think makes it interesting. When you go to grayscale, you start looking at things much more geometrically much more graphically. I agree. So what, what, what did you use to convert this? What do you normally use to convert your color images to black and white? So I honestly, this one I did manually just by tweaking, tweaking up and down contrast. And uh, I think also, also I played a little bit with the red slider to get, uh, to get a little bit more richness, even in black and white in that wood. Uh, when I'm, Trying to do something really experimentally, I think Nick Silver FX Pro is is today the, the the black and white darkroom of choice because it lets you experiment so much and it lets you visualize quickly different methods of uh, of handling it. And then I think it, it it begs the question: Well, then why aren't you shooting originally in black and white? Why do you shoot originally? In color at all. And the answer to that goes back to our good old days, Steve, when we were taking colored filters, such as red filters, um, orange filters, to be able to enhance different areas of the photograph. So in the old days, when you wanted to make a blue sky go to almost black, you put an absolute red filter right on your camera and you were shooting that what the red filter would do is it would shut out the blues that's how it makes things red and then when that goes on to the black and white film that sky looks a deep deep dark 
dark shade. Uh, today, if you want to do the same thing in digital processing, if you have color in your original image, well, just think about it. You can take green leaves, you can make just the greens darker, or you can bring them out lighter. You can take red elements, make them darker, lighter. It gives you so many options of selecting things within your image to be able to then change the grayscale tones of those images. And I think that probably the most uh, dramatic of these is uh, anyone who's shooting in infrared, well, they get rid of the, of, of the color altogether, but you could see how color and warmth can totally change. So in a grayscale image, You'll have uh, you'll have uh, green leaves turning stark white in the image and looking from almost from a different planet. But having that color information really helps you. I know of only one camera where it pays to shoot in black and white, and that's one of the Leica cameras. I don't remember if it's what, the M10. Or, M10 or might be where it, or... it, it's a it's a monochrome camera. But what's special about that camera is the dynamic range on it and the sharpness on it. Uh, the detail, even at super high ISOs, is so great that it makes it worth shooting originally in monochrome. But otherwise, I would say shoot in color. And even if you're thinking of going monochrome while you're shooting it, process the monochrome later on in your in your favorite digital process and software. And, and then you have both as well. I, I want to move to a speed round. So for this... I don't think I had the speed round thing that I do now when you were on the show before. So okay. uh, just answer these as fast as they come to your head. Number one, your favorite photography tip. Walk around your subject, look at it from all different angles, especially ways that other people aren't doing. It's the entire basis of the platypod. This is not just a gimmick. This is a way to get you to look at things different. Drop this down to the ground and look at it from underneath. Go behind, go over, go on top, look straight down, look straight up. You'll see that in my in in my uh, portfolio, you know, especially there's an image of part of the Baltimore World Trade Center building which looks kind of like a um, a skateboarder's uh, ramp going in there, a, a tunnel going in where, you know, normally you would look at that building totally different. So walk around your subject. I think the way that uh, Rick Salmon puts it is use your camera like a drone or a helicopter. Go high, low, left, right. Look at things at different ways. Okay. The biggest photography mistake you almost made or did make? <laughs> oh, I think it's that I, the, the first camera I bought was a Konica instead of the Nicker mat. <laughs> I was debating that the longest time. I was about 15 years old, and gosh, I, I should have gone for the Nikon glass right right to start with. Favorite composition rule, if you have one? It's a combination of two rules. Know the rule of thirds and know how to break it. I like that one. Any bucket list photo shoot for you? <sighs> wow. Probably the Canadian Rockies, I would think about. And the other is I would love to do what you do and <laughs> shoot a concert. I got tickets to the Paul McCartney concert coming up Ooh. in uh, in June. And gosh, would I love to get a press pass and shoot that from up, up close. Well, that is so much fun. And let me add, my buddy David Bergman, a very good friend of mine, does his Shoot From The Pit workshop, shootfromthepit.com. If anybody out there... I do workshops on concert photography, uh, and I've got one, in fact, theoretically starting the day that I think I'm releasing this at PrincetonPhotoWorkshop.com. But uh, those of you that want to actually shoot a concert, David Bergman Shoot from the Pit, he takes you to a Luke Combs Stadium Arena style concert. You get all access. He does like a three-hour, four-hour presentation, keynote presentation takes you out, shows you the arena, and then you shoot the show. Um, it's a great thing, his shoot from the pit. So, David, there's a plug for for, for David. Uh, your, this one's a, you got a catch to it, okay? You can't name Platypod or Platyball. Your favorite photography gadget. 
other than my camera? Yeah, yeah. Like accessory. And no, you wow. can't name a because I, I see you thinking you can't say my memory card. No. I would say a shoot through umbrella. Oh, Honestly, I did not see that coming. It is a portable softbox. It's so easy to use and set up. You can put it. And honestly, most of the time I, I use a, uh, a light stand for that. But you take that somewhere where to family or whatever, and you want to do some nice photo shoots. One simple shoot through umbrella changes that whole image. And, and you just get so much nicer portraits. And they now have, you know, they have umbrellas that fold down to 12 inches and out to 42 inches. And gosh, I get so much use out of those. Easy to carry too. So last question. Is there a photographer that you think more people should know about and follow? Oh, absolutely. It's an easy answer. You know, in my, in my medical practice, I take care of babies up to 20 and up to adolescence and through till 21 years of age. And a lot of the kids will come in and tell me, you know, they see my pictures on the wall and they'll talk to me about it being interested in photography and the first two books I have them buy are Learning to See Creatively and Understanding Exposure by Brian Peterson. And uh, if you've uh, never seen some of Brian's videos, you got to read these two books. Learning to See Creatively does exactly what I was talking about. It's telling you, teaching you how to look at subjects differently. Because most of photography is begins with seeing, begins with being able to look at your subject. Yep. And in understanding exposure, Brian makes it very simple. And these books are in their, I think, third or fourth editions already. Very simple to understand how to, uh, uh, you know, how to expose properly and how to use shutter speed and aperture. These are the fundamentals of photography. Beautifully presented, very inexpensive. I've met Brian on several occasions. He's a, he's a funny guy, a little bit of a kooky guy, but you got to love him. And he's an amazing uh, photography teacher. And then to learn to know to use Photoshop, there's nothing like Scott Kelby's uh, books uh, on uh, Adobe Photoshop for digital photography. And I highly recommend uh, that as well. So, and, and let me add on the Scott Kelby thing. Uh, I have recently created a discount code page on the website BehindTheShot.tv. And I've got a Platypod code in there. I've got a Lens Rentals code in there. Kelby One, Creative Live, Flurn. These are not affiliate codes so that everybody knows I'm not making anything on these. I literally emailed Larry and said, I want to do this discount page just for viewers and listeners. Would you be interested in participating? So I have a code up there for Platypod. And if you're interested at all in Kelby stuff, because Kelby One is a phenomenal resource, uh, I highly recommend that as well. Last question. I know I said the other one was, but last question. For the Platypod Extreme, is there a timeline? Well, the timeline's very, very simple. The Platyball was delayed by, and I know I'm not supposed to talk about it, but you're asking me about it. So uh, the Platyball was delayed well over a year on Kickstarter, both because of redesign issues and because of COVID, where we had some significant delays. The Platypod Extreme is already on order, and it's going to be on its way as we speak. By the end of Kickstarter, we will have, I think, the first thousand of these in stock, ready to ship out to our early uh, Platypod Extreme backers. This program is going to deliver within within two months, three months of the end of uh, Kickstarter. So the timeline is very fast. Kickstarter runs through May 9th. And uh, after that, uh, there'll probably be a little bit of a delay till you can till you can get one. Uh, so I would encourage everybody to please go ahead and there's a nice discount on uh, Kickstarter as well. Okay. Yeah. Cause I was going to say that doesn't look like a prototype. It looks like the finished product. So it's this ready is to actually, go. Yeah. This is actually the, it, we call it a pre-production model because this is exactly what is being made uh, currently. Okay. So if people want to find more about uh, you, let's start with you, Dr. Larry Tiefenbrunn founder, CEO of Platypod, your portfolio, give your portfolio again so people can go look at your work. 
So uh, I think you'll have it in the uh, in the show notes. Ljtmd.smugmug.com. Okay. And then Platypod is platypod.com. It's at Platypod on YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn, and at Platypod Tripods on Instagram or Twitter. Yes. And we've got, a. I think we have over 1,200 of our own postings on, um, on Instagram, plus many other people that have contributed. Plus, please, I encourage people, we put out two blog posts every week, very informative, and that's on platypod.com. Just click the blog uh, link. And we also release a monthly newsletter by email, which highlights three photographers, three interesting setups used for Platypod. And you'll always learn a little something from these. These come out once a month, every month. And to sign up, it's so easy. Go to platypod.com. You'll be prompted for your email. We do not sell or give out our email list to anyone at any price. And uh, you'll be able to get not only the um, the monthly newsletter, but also when we have major announcements, such as uh, such as a major sale or a, uh, a a Kickstarter program, and there are more things in the pipeline. Uh, so this way, you'll be informed. We have over ten thousand people who are regular subscribers to our monthly newsletter, and it's free. Larry, it is always so good to see you, my friend. Thank you so much because I know how busy you are. Thank you for doing this. I really, really appreciate it. You just did Kelby yesterday, uh, you know, as far as the day this is released, and now you're doing this one. And I appreciate you putting me early in the the, the announcements. And I wish you all the luck on the new product, Stephen. It's likewise, it's an honor to be here with you and with your wonderful audience. You have such a beautiful, dedicated audience and a, a terrific show. I think what you're doing is great, and I hope you do it for many happy, healthy years to come with your lovely wife, Deb. Thank you so very much. Dr. Larry Tiefenbrunn, platypod.com. Make sure you check it out. If you need to reach out to me, as you know, you can always go to behindtheshot.tv or stevebrazel.com. If you want to hit me up on either Twitter or Instagram, it's at Steve Brazel for my personal one, at Behind the Shot TV for the podcast. Thanks so much as always for watching. Make sure you join us on the next show as we try and get inside the mind of a great photographer by taking a closer look behind the shot. 